I see him. Morning, everyone. Welcome. This is the precursor to the gala tea. <laughs> anyway, today we're going to talk about or explore the natural and cultural history of Namibia. Uh, and I'm most, most people, when they think of Namibia, they think desert. I wonder why. Anyway, that could be because Namibia itself is located between the Namib Desert on the coast and the Kalahari Desert that's a little further inland. Uh, it's no surprise then that uh, Namibia is the country with the least amount of rainfall in all of South Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. So if you're down below the Sahara Desert, this place gets less rain than any place else. One of the interesting facts, though, is that there's only about 1% of the land in the country that's arable. In other words, they can farm only about 1% of the land. But half of the population of the people that live here are engaged in some form of farming and agriculture. Namibia's coastal desert is one of the oldest deserts in the world. The dunes here are made up of little teeny tiny grains of sand that are coated with a very thin layer of iron oxide. And the bright color that you'll see, usually really early in the morning or late in the afternoon, uh, is an indication of the sand's age. <clears throat> and that's because it takes time for that iron that's on the outside of the sand to begin to rust uh, or oxidize. And like, kind of like a rusty bicycle or metal, the older the dune is here, the darker and more intense the color will be. The sands here are about 5 million years old. Namibia's sand dunes are the highest in the world. Some of them reach really spectacular heights. And they were created by a kind of a series of onshore winds coming off of the South Atlantic. And the winds change direction. So essentially, over time, they blow from different directions. And that causes the sand dunes to form in these very unusual shapes. And a lot of them are considered to be star-shaped dunes. Uh, the wind pattern also means that the dunes don't move very much at all. They pretty much stay in one place. They don't migrate around as they do in other deserts. But Namibia is not all desert. The Great Escarpment, which uh, abruptly, abruptly rises right out of the middle of the country, about 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet. Now, the escarpment is just basically a steep slope or a long cliff uh, that occurs because of the tilting or warping, and that happened... Uh, when South America broke away from Africa, actually when the whole plate things happened, all of the continents started to move away. And when Africa was first broken away from, there was a tilting here in the southern part of the continent, and that pushed this thing up. Uh, it separates two relatively level areas uh, that, that are defining uh, the country itself. On the west side is the low flat area, a lot of which is the uh, Namib Desert. On the east side is the high plateau, and that high plateau, of course, is out where the Kalahari is. The Great Escarpment was formed about 80 million years ago. Uh, today it stretches pretty much all the way from the north to the south through Namibia, and it's a, essentially a continuous range with some gaps in it that were caused by erosion over millions of years. Namibia has some pretty interesting flora as well. <clears throat> the desert plant that has caused the most interest to, among bot botanists, probably even you when you get a chance to see one, is a living fossil. Uh, Tumboa is its local name or its common name. Uh, basically, the Mirabilis part of its scientific name, which of which of which area, Mirabilis. Mirabilis means uh, uh, basically marvelous or wonderful in Latin. Uh, it's, and it's an interesting plant. The local tribes here call it the onion of the desert because the core of the plant is edible and it was used as food by the people in earlier times. The core of this plant is said to be pretty tasty whether it's raw or cooked. Doesn't look real tasty right there, I don't think. Uh, so what's all the fuss about? It's a succulent. Uh, it's one of the oldest plants known to man. It can live up to 1,500 years. Uh, the plant species is thought to be a relic from back in the Jurassic period. You know, that was that big theme park that they made a movie about. <laughs> this plant was back there. Anyway, and it's changed very little since that time. It survives 
just on the moisture that it gets, absorbs through its leaves uh, from dew and fog. Again, because there's little or no rain. The tumboa is on the National uh, Namibian Coat of Arms. This plant really, only, each plant only has two leaves, and they grow continuously from the stem and base and roots uh, for the life of the plant. And the leaves here are unique because they are still, no matter how old the plant is, the green leaves are still the same two leaves that were there when the plant was just a seedling. The leaves are never shed. They just continue to grow. Talk about a few of the creatures that live in the sand dunes. The Namib uh, sand gecko, this little guy, uh, he gets to be maximum maybe 13 centimeters, about 5 inches long. Uh, they're very pale, nearly translucent, and they have these kind of salmon-colored uh, undertones. Uh, the skin is covered with very, very fine, smooth scales, and it's nearly transparent. Some of the gecko's internal organs can actually be seen through its skin. The sand gecko is nocturnal, and it spends its day deep, deep underground. They burrow down about a meter, about a yard beneath the surface, and they come out at night to eat things like termites and ants and beetles and grasshoppers and even a few spiders. This is a hand of a guide that we had uh, last time we were in Namibia. He walked out on sand that was just smooth sand, started scooping down and came up with this little guy. Now to put him back, he didn't just throw him back on the sand because it was daytime and the little guy would get burnt on the sand. So he took the little guy, dug another hole, get down deep, and then he stayed there until the little gecko actually tunneled back under the sand. He also got for us the white lady spider. Uh, the spider is named after a famous painting that's in the rock painting that's found here in Namibia. Uh, these spiders can get to be about five inches across. Uh, their large holes are usually covered by an interwoven sheet of silk and sand. In fact, again, from the surface, you can't see where those spiders are. Uh, they are poisonous. Um, they're very hard to find, but our guide, again, walked along and just kind of went down and dug one up and put it on a stick to show to us. Uh, he wanted us to hold it, but since it was poisonous, none of us were really into that. Uh, these spiders will, will position themselves upside down in their tunnels underneath that little cover that they build, and they listen for the vibrations of other critters that are coming along, and they do that with these very sensitive hairs that are on their legs. Uh, when they hear something up above that sounds like something they're going to want to eat, the spider jumps up through the surface and ambushes its prey. Uh, the common species taken by this white lady spider include that little sand gecko that I showed just a minute ago, beetles, and even other white lady spiders. The male of this species, he might cover really long distances. Now, in spider terms, when you're only about five inches across, a long distance doesn't have to be miles. It could be just a couple of hundred yards at the most. Anyway, they cover pretty long distances at night in search of mates. And as they go along, when they finally find where there might be a mate, they start to tap a little song with their feet on the sand. And if the little female white lady spider likes what she hears, she could come up out of her burrow and mate. If she doesn't <laughs> like what she hears, she will come up out of her burrow and have the male for dinner. <laughs> True love. Ah, this is everybody's favorite, the dung beetle. Everybody knows what dung is, right? Uh, before you dismiss this hard-working little critter, you've got to realize that they are found worldwide, not just in Namibia. They're found on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, they live in habitats that range from very dry deserts all the way to pretty lush forests. These beetles are one of the few insect species that actually care for their young. For three months, the mother dung beetle will remain with the little ball of dung that she has her eggs planted in, and she will make sounds while she's with that ball, probably, well, what scientists think, or at least the, the people that study those things, entomologists, they think that uh, she's probably talking to her young. And these little guys or girls were the, the inspiration for the Egyptian scarab beetles. Interestingly enough, the dung beetle uses the Milky Way to navigate. So Norman Case isn't the only one that understands the stars. <laughs> in 
It's kind of interesting because it adds to another kind of a list of sky clues or compass clues that uh, these animals, these insects use, and they include the sun, the moon, and polarized light. And the beetles draw on all of that stuff to maintain a very straight path as they're going across the desert or across any place. In addition, the Namibian version of this uh, particular beetle uh, appears to have a built-in pedometer. So, you know, like we have a lot of people, they walk around the deck, up on deck 10, you know, they get exercise. Well, this little beetle could do the same thing, but the little beetle always counts its steps, and it knows exactly how far it has to go back to get to its nest. So for a little teeny insect, it has pretty incredible powers. I wish I was that lucky. At the south end of Walvis Bay, which is going to be our first port, by the way, there's the Walvis Bay Lagoon and Assault Pans. Uh, at, established back not really that long ago, back in 1964, the Salt Pans are one of the largest solar evaporation facilities in Africa. They operate on an area of about 4,500 hectares, or some 11,000 acres. Um, 30 million tons of seawater a year gets processed through this set of uh, ponds. They produce about 750,000 metric tons of very high-quality salt. All right, yeah, I'm going to tell you how they do it. Water gets pumped in from a natural lagoon, basically the Walvis Lagoon, and it goes through a series of concentration ponds. Each pond has a little more concentrated salt in it. Uh, all of that concentration is stimulated by wind and sun and the brine and salinity content gradually increases until it reaches about 25%. At that point, it's pumped into a crystallization pond where it's let, uh, allowed to completely evaporate out. And then the salt and crystals are formed uh, in a layer of minerals that you can see kind of where the whites are. Uh, once the salt crystals have grown to the required depth, I didn't know there was a required depth for salt crystals, but apparently there is. Uh, the salt is removed uh, by some mechanical harvesters. We would normally call those bulldozers. Uh, it's transported to a wash plant where it's washed with fresh water, and then it's, uh, with, there's also some diluted brine in there. And then the salt is dried in a big centrifuge and stored in these huge stockpiles uh, for further draining. Eventually all of the moisture just drains out of that salt into the ground below. The red color that's in this salt is from a thing called halobacteria. It's also known as salt or ocean bacteria. And it's very important in the operation of the ponds as the more color that's in the pond, uh, basically it causes the temperatures to go up, it causes it to absorb more sunlight and in turn, all of that causes the evaporation to happen a little faster. Conditions are ideal along the Namibian coastline for oyster farming uh, because this is where there's very cold ocean water coming up from down south, and it meets a very nutrient-rich current that's coming down from the north. Uh, the current brings an abundance of oxygen and plankton, which basically speeds up the growth of the oysters. Uh, locally grown oysters here are considered to be among the best in the world. Of course, if you go to Oregon or Washington or even uh, Chesapeake Bay, they'll tell you their oysters are the best in the world. But here the oysters are exported very far away, some as far away as China. Walvis Bay itself is a natural deep water harbor, and it's protected by a thing called Pelican Point. It's a sand spit, and that makes it very rich in plankton and marine life. So guess who else comes here to have a little snack? The southern, ooh, went too far. The southern great white whale, right whale, excuse me, along with vast schools, huge schools of fish. Now originally these magnificent creatures were called right whales simply because the whalers found that after they were killed they floated. So that made them the right whale to hunt terrible way to get a name, isn't it? The whale attracted a lot of uh, fishing vessels and whalers because the resources they could provide. Uh, they, these whales have a huge amount of blubber that at the time was cooked down to produce whale oil. Whales also had a thing in their mouth or have a thing in their mouth that's called baleen. Uh, baleen is a very fibrous structure that they use to, to filter out their food from the water that they slush through their mouth. Uh, 
Uh, why did everybody want baleen back during the era of uh, whale hunting? Because the ladies needed it for their corset stays. I think they use plastic. Do they even have corsets anymore? I hope not. Anyway, today in Namibia, most of the confirmed whale sightings are down south. When we get to Luteritz, there's a better chance of seeing the whales. And only a few, maybe a handful or so of these whales will travel this far north uh, to get to the, what they would call the breeding grounds at Walvis Bay. The seal colony here has a population of about 20,000 Cape fur seals. Uh, they have no predators in the, in the water, uh, except maybe an occasional great white shark offshore. But their survival is really dependent on the offshore islands uh, where they come up on land to breed. And the islands protect the, the seals from the uh, mainland predators such as hyenas and jackals. Uh, they were hunted almost to the brink of extinction uh, for their fur and their oil. In fact, the London street lamps for, for many, many years at one time were fueled using oil from the Cape Fur Seals. At Luteritz, at the southern end of our uh, visit to Namibia, that harbor, you might see some Havisite dolphin. It'll be close to the shore. Uh, the dolphin was named for Captain Havisite, who carried one of them from Namibia up to the United Kingdom to be put on display up there in the early 19th century. The Havisite dolphin is fairly small and grows to about two meters, uh, maybe just a little over five and a half feet in length. Uh, size and bluntness of their heads uh, makes a lot of people think that these dolphins are porpoises instead of dolphins. Uh, Havisite are very active and they're social animals. Uh, they typically congregate in, in small pods or groups of between five and ten, and rarely, sometimes they're seen in even larger groups. They're very fast swimmers, and part of their play and social activity are vertical jumps uh, that are well clear of the water. They sometimes will turn in the air, and they'll fall back into the sea virtually with no splash. They're really good divers. They would get really good scores in the Olympics. And as we get down around Luteritz, you might want to keep an eye out for them as we're in that area because they're really kind of interesting and a lot of fun to watch. The Walvis Bay Lagoon is one of the best flamingo viewing places in the whole world. Uh, at, at times, uh, there could be more than 40,000 individual birds that are found in the salt pans and the ponds all around the bay. Uh, they have both the lesser and the greater flamingos. Guess what the biggest difference is? The greater are bigger. The lesser are littler. Now, the lesser flamingo uh, that you can see here is usually a little lighter in color, a little lighter pink, sometimes almost white. And as with all the flamingos, the color of the plumage is determined by the food that they eat. Uh, both of these species here feed on green algae. And when they digest that green algae, it turns their feathers pink. And it's called halobacteria, and it is the blue-green algae that's found in the ocean. Uh, that bacteria is the same one that colors the salt. Now, when you go there, when there's a bus stop that's right near where all these pelicans are, and a lot of the, the excursions stop there. And so you can get out and you can go take pictures of the, of the flamingos. Okay? But if you get out and you make too much noise, they're going to be gone because they'll take off and fly in a heartbeat. So you won't get a picture of anything except the sea, seashore. There are about 620 bird species that are native to Namibia. The national bird of the country was at one time the crimson-breasted shrike, and that's because its colors match those of the imperial German flag. Well, since that's no longer politically correct in Namibia, the African fish eagle has now been uh, named as the country's national bird. Now, as we go down to Luteritz, uh, you can look for the endangered African penguin. It's one of the two places you'll be able to see these birds as we continue on our cruise. In 2009, there, nine, there was an oil spill offshore from a tanker, and that just endangered hundreds of these little birds. Uh, they're also known as a jackass penguin because they have a donkey like, ee -aw, kind of a bray. I know you guys love it when I do those bird calls. 
they have a really distinctive pink patch that's up over their eye. It's a little patch of pink skin that's right above the eye, as well as a very distinctive facial mask. Uh, that pink gland is really one that helps them adjust to changing temperatures. Uh, if it gets too warm, their system will pump more blood into that little gland, and then the cool air will, will help cool them down. And when they do get too warm, that pink gland becomes almost a dark red. It gets very, very dark. Penguins' black and white coloring is a variety of very important camouflage called countershading. Its white belly means that from predators looking up from down below have a hard time seeing it because they kind of blend in with the waves in the sky above, and the dark coloring on their back protects them from predators looking down at them from outside the water. You're going to have another opportunity to see these things when we get down to Cape Town because there's a couple of colonies down there. There are several main ethnic groups in Namibia. Uh, many of them are called the colored, and they include people that are known as the bastards, and they're about, they represent about 8% of the population of Namibia. The name baster is derived from the Dutch word for bastard or crossbreed. And a lot of people would consider that term demeaning, but the baster people themselves, uh, they pretty proudly use the term as an indication of their own history. They're concerned that their unique heritage will be lost in modern Namibia. Uh, they're descendants of Cape Colony Dutch who married indigenous African women. Back in the uh, late 1800s, around 1870, some 330 bastards moved from the Cape Colony in South Africa up to Namibia, and they founded the town in Namibia known as Rehoboth, where they gained some autonomy from the German colonizers in the country itself. Today there's about 35,000 Rehoboth bastards, and they are a very respected segment of the Namibian nation. The Awambuko uh, make up about half, maybe, of the population. Uh, their present numbers in Namibia are about a million and a half people, and that followed, they're followed uh, by the Kavango, who have about 9%. Uh, the river is pivotal. They live right alongside of a river, and it's pivotal to their survival, uh, primarily of their whole tribe. They grow crops on a very narrow strip of fertile soil that's alongside the river. They also graze cattle on the floodplains and fish the river extensively. They hunt the few wild animals that live there. Their traditional huts are built in these little groups of uh, things with these uh, vertical fence made out of posts. Uh, each of the buildings in those little circles is some different kind of a building, has a different purpose. It could be a storeroom, a kitchen, a bedroom, and so on. Most of the families here collect their water from a nearby common well or perhaps even a tap if there happens to be a pump nearby. Traditionally, the Kavango believe in one supreme being. They have believed that for a long time. And his cooperation is secured by a prayers as well as sacrifices to their ancestors and they also adhere to a wide range of other re religious prohibitions. Uh, diviners uh, and medicine men are highly respected in the country, even though most of the Kavango now practice uh, Christianity, but they're kind of a blend of Christianity with native uh, activities. Many of the Awambuko uh, consider themselves Lutheran, and that's because of the German and Finnish missionaries who came here in the 1870s. Traditionally, the Awambo people were highly influenced by a combination of magic and religion. And their belief centers on Kalunga, the father god, and he made all things on earth. But again, their version of Lutheranism is kind of a combination of uh, traditional and modern religions. By the time uh, their god got to the trees, he was pretty tired, so he planted the baobab trees upside down. And that's why the roots look like branches up in the top, uh, and they extend well up into the sky. With a belief in Kalunga comes a set of expectations and manners among the people. When a tribe member wants to enter a chief's hut or kraal or enclosure, they must remove their sandals. They must take their shoes off uh, because it's said if the person does not remove their, their footwear, it will bring death to someone in the royal family. Another one of their beliefs deals with a burning fire that's in the chief's crawl or enclosure. 
If that fire goes out, the chief and the tribe will disappear. So it's kind of an eternal flame that they keep going continuously. Members of the Awa'ambo uh, royal family have a claim to chieftainship only by birth uh, because descendants is matrilineal, which is a little different than an awful lot of societies. The relations always fall on the mother's side. So a chief's sons, his own sons, have no claim on the royal crown or the royal family. Uh, they grow up just as regular members of the tribe. The Awa'ambo brew a traditional liquor uh, you might want to try this. It's called umbiki. Uh, it's distilled from uh, fermented fruit mash. Now, umbiki uh, mixed with sugar is called umangeligeli. It's more potent and sometimes poisonous. <laughs> An English newspaper has reported uh, that they also use old clothes, shoes, and tires as flavoring ingredients. <laughs> Makes me want to run out and buy a couple quarts of that stuff. The Kavango are the ones who make the beautiful wood carving and baskets, uh, clay pots, as well as ornaments that you can see here in the country. Uh, the men are very skilled at transforming dolph wood uh, of the Kalahari sand areas into a variety of things like ceremonial drums and musical instruments, as well as household items. The women here weave baskets and they make pots and ornaments. Uh, that they'll, they'll sell those to visitors. You'll have an opportunity to buy those. The Kavango have traditional male and female roles. The men do the hard labor, and they care for the cattle. Uh, cattle here are very highly valued as a status symbol. The more cows you have, the wealthier you are. And the cattle here are used for milk, meat, hides, and cultivating, as well as for rituals and for animal sacrifices. The Herero people take pride in their cattle. Hence, the women dress like this. Their hats are shaped like the horns of cows. Their ancestors are honored by the sacrifice of cows and other animals. Uh, there were about 250,000 Herero people in Namibia five years ago, and they haven't been recounted since then. That represented about 7% of the total population. The Herero women still wear these Victorian-style long dresses with long sleeves. And that's pretty hard to believe when you consider that they live in the desert uh, and it's hot and it's arid and it's very dry. Uh, ironically, they got all of these costumes or these dress styles from the Germans who once tried to wipe the tribe out. The Herero speak a Bantu language and they have several subdivisions within their culture. The Herero believe in witches uh, who fly around at night, sort of like a ghost person, if you will. And those beings talk at night, and when people hear those voices, uh, basically they'll shout to try to scare the witches away. I hear voices at night all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's her talking in her sleep. Uh, anyway, uh, others resort to sleeping with candles that are lighted all the time, believing that the witches fear the light. And some may even bring in these spiritual doctors uh, to come in and perform ceremonies to chase the entity away from their houses. The Himba has an estimated population of about 50,000 people in Namibia. They're predominantly livestock farmers who breed a couple of animals. One is a fat-tailed sheep, and then there's also some goats. Uh, they count their wealth and the number of those animals that they have. Uh, their women collect firewood and attend to things like calabash vines. They take care of the, those kind of tasks. They also are responsible for milking the cows and goats. The men's main task is herding the, the herds that they have, which a lot of times will take them away from the family uh, for extended periods of time. In the Himba culture, goat dung... <laughs> has a medicinal purpose. Uh, it's regularly used for healing chicken pox. The goat skin has many uses too, and they can create a lot of household ornaments as well as they make pretty good backpacks for carrying babies. The women plaster their houses with a traditional mixture of red clay soil and cow manure as a binding agent. Uh, the himba here are polygamous, and the average himba man uh, has uh, two wives uh, all at the same time. Uh, the women and girls tend to perform the more labor-intensive work 
uh, than the men and boys do. The men and boys are out taking care of the herds, and the women and the girls will do things like carry water from distant places into the village. Himba women prepare an incense, uh, and the smoke is then used as an antimicrobial body cleansing agent and a deodorant. Uh, the fragrance is made by burning these aromatic herbs and resins. Uh, both the fire and the livestock are pretty closely rigid, uh, tied to the veneration of the dead. Uh, the sacred fire represents the ancestral protection, and the sacred livestock allows, quote, proper relations between the humans and their ancestors, unquote. The women of this semi-nomadic tribe uh, get their skin color from a mixture of oil and ochre. Uh, Achazai's paste is a mixture of butterfat and ochre pigment that's used to cleanse the skin over long periods of time, uh, mostly because they don't have water. So they take this mixture and they rub it on their skin. They do this routinely probably every day. Uh, it protects them from the extremely hot, dry climate, and it also protects them from insect bites. The Himba women wear these thick braids uh, and animal hide skirts and headdresses and ornaments. Now in this picture, uh, the two women on the left side with a dark, almost gray look to their hair are unmarried. And you can tell that they're unmarried because of the style where their hair comes down and like pigtails hanging down in the front somewhat like a veil. Uh, the, sometimes the one braid, uh, uh, if it's a boy, you'll see one braid, it'll go down in the back for a young boy. Uh, two braids for girls uh, extend forward to make that veil, and they'll have those braids until they're married. Usually a gathering of these Himba women in Swakopmund, uh, which is the little town or city that's very close to Walvis Bay, uh, and a lot of people, I think, are going to go to Swakopmund, uh, they're usually found right behind the local museum. And they don't mind having their pictures taken, if... If you buy a trinket, it could be just a little bracelet, a little statue, whatever. If you are good enough to just buy something from them, you can take all the pictures you want. Use all your digits up just taking pictures of these beautiful women, and they're perfectly happy to let you do that. But they would like you to buy something. They don't just want you to give them money to take their picture. Um, just to, it's interesting to watch these women and the interface between themselves, the interplay between them and their children. Because you've got these little children, usually they're little toddlers and smaller, and they're all running around where these women are, and, and the way they interact with their mothers is really pretty amazing. Uh, it's really kind of a nice thing to see the, how caring they are. Now, you don't see any men. The men are about 20 yards away in traditional Western dress. And they're there, why? To kind of keep an eye, not because they're afraid the women are going to do something wrong, but to protect the women. But anyway, Swakamun is a really great place to visit, and as I said, it's not very far from Walvis Bay. Uh, the first Europeans to disembark and explore the Namibian region were the Portuguese navigators back in the late 15th century. Uh, but they didn't settle here. I mean, when you see this thing from the coastline, you're not going to want to settle here either. Uh, Namibia wasn't extensively explored by Europeans until the 19th century, not that long ago, and that's when the German and Swedish traders uh, came here and settled. Uh, the town of Luderitz began its life as a little trading play, uh, post uh, when the land was purchased by a German tobacco merchant named Alfred Luderitz, uh, when he, or Adolf, excuse me, uh, when he did not return from an expedition to the village. Uh, they decided they'd name the settlement after him. Most of the surrounding area around the town was purchased just a few years later. What is now Namibia uh, became a German colony in 1884 under Otto von Bismarck. He wanted to basically stop or stall the British advancements in Africa. Uh, but the British governor in Cape Town had determined that the only natural deep water port it was Walvis Bay, and that was the only thing that was worth occupying. So just Walvis Bay was annexed to the Cape Province by the British in South Africa. Swakopmund was founded just a little ways away in 1892 by the Germans, and a sizable part of the population there today is still has some German-speaking uh, capability. 
city is situated on the uh, edge of the Namib Desert. It's the fourth largest population center in the country. Uh, nearby Mondesa Township was established to provide housing for the Herero people that work in Swakopmund. During the colonial era, blacks were not allowed to live in the center of Swakopmund. In 1903, some of the tribes rose in revolt and about 60 German settlers were killed. German general then issued orders to kill every male Herero and drive the women and children into the desert. Some 65,000 of the Herero people were murdered. That was 80% of their population at the time. When the general's order was finally lifted, prisoners were herded into concentration camps and they were used as slave labor. Many of the Herero people died from overwork and malnutrition. And when the survivors were released from detention, they were then deported or they were forced into labor, racial segregation and discrimination areas. It took until about 1908 to reestablish the German authority over the territory by that time, some 100,000 Africans had been killed. Uh, memory of that genocide is deeply ingrained in Namibia. The people here, it's, it's one of those things that's almost visceral. The German government formally apologized for this finally in, uh, to the Namibians in 2004. At the same time, trade in looterates began to surge. Railway worker found a diamond just laying in the sand. Oh, wow, you found a diamond. That's going to spread the news pretty quickly. The adjacent diamond mining settlement of Kolmanskop was uh, built. Uh, in its heyday, hundreds of families lived in the German-influenced town. This is a little different. I'm going to take a little aside here. A little different than other mining communities because they don't have a big pit where they went down and they dug the mine. Their workers literally crawled on hands and knees through the sand, picking up the diamonds because they were just laying in the sand. You go there today, and there are signs that say, if you find a diamond, do not pick it up. It's against the law. It's a protected site. Anyway, this little facility uh, had a hospital, a ballroom, a casino, a bowling alley, and the first X-ray station in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, today, Coleman Scop's exteriors have pretty much been battered by the wind and very little remains of the town's former glory. When you go there, you can see in your mind, you can imagine how wonderful this town must have been at one time. But today, it fights a constant struggle against being buried under the shifting sand dunes of the Namib Desert. There's something that's pretty riveting about the desolation of this town as the whole thing is slowly being absorbed back into the sand. It's an interesting, interesting place. I think people that go there will, will really enjoy it. South Africa occupied Luderitz in 1915 after defeating the German forces in World War I, and they administered Luderitz from then onward as a League of Nations mandated territory. Uh, many Germans were deported. The, that contributed to the colony's shrinking population numbers. Uh, during the occupation of Namibia by South Africa, White commercial farmers represented only two-tenths of a percent of the total population of the country, but they owned 74 percent of the arable land. In 1946, South Africa refused to surrender Namibia. Uh, the Herero Chiefs Council, which was a council of all of the native chiefs within the country, uh, submitted a number of petitions to the United Nations calling for the UN to grant Namibia independence. In 1966, the People's Liberation Army of Namibia began a long guerrilla campaign in the struggle for independence. It wasn't until 1988 that South Africa agreed to end its occupation of Namibia. Namibia's independence was arranged under a diplomatic agreement between South Africa, Angola, and Cuba, along with the USSR and the USA, as observers. Uh, as a result, Cuba agreed to remove or pull back all of its troops that were stationed in Angola. Namibia's first uh, one-person, one-vote elections uh, for the Constitutional Assembly took place a year later in 1989. The official election slogan at the time was fair and free elections. Namibia's first pres president was Sam Njoma. Uh, he was sworn in right after the election. 
uh, he was carefully watched over and kind of guided, if you will, by another man from just a little further to the south who was quite famous, the name of Nelson Mandela, who had been released from prison just a month before Nujoma took office. There were also representatives some 100, from some 147 countries, including 20 heads of state that watched the whole process of the election. Uh, Walvis Bay was finally uh, ceded to Namibia at the end of the apartheid in South Africa in 1994. Namibia has started uh, to do some expropriating of land from white farmers and they want to resettle those land landless black Namibians back into the farms that they had in antiquity. Agreement has been reached uh, on the privatization of several more enterprises and those will start to turn over in the years ahead. The governments of Germany and Britain are financing Namibia's land reform process uh, quite successfully, I might add, uh, and there are hopes that it will stimulate much needed uh, foreign investment across the country. Uh, there are still some hopes that all of this is, is going to be pretty progressive. Since 1991, English is the only official language in Namibia, although some 3% of the population still... Uh, 3% of the people speak English at home. The rest of the time they speak uh, Bantu or some of the original uh, African languages. Now, I think you're going to like Namibia. It's a really interesting country. It's very refreshing after what we have experienced in some of the other places in West Africa. Uh, it is not without uh, poverty. There are some poor people, and outside of Swakopman, there are some villages that are extremely poor. Uh, but one of the things you will notice as you go around Namibia it's a relatively clean country. There, you don't see the debris and the litter here that you did in some of the other places in West Africa. The people are quite friendly. They do accept uh, American money. <clears throat> they also accept Euro. They prefer small bills. They don't like large bills except late in the afternoon when they will trade their small bills back to you for some large bills. Uh, it's kind of an interesting um, exchange rate thing. And, but I think you'll really like it here. Uh, from Walvis Bay to Swakopman, then the north part, our first port. Very, very interesting, very, I I'll say pretty towns. They're very clean, uh, very nice looking places. Now I'm going to go down the hall to Baristas. <clears throat> this thing will repeat on Channel 9. If you want to talk to me about Namibia or what we're going to do there, please come down and join me. And I'd like to thank you. Enjoy the day. <clears throat>